Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Bellevue City Council regular meeting for March 22nd, 2021. Happy spring. Um, we had a great event at the Bellevue Downtown Park Saturday night. It was an anti-hate rally for our AAPI community. Just an amazing turnout. Almost a thousand people stood in solidarity against hatred. And I, it was a very good reminder that there's just no place for hate in Bellevue. I also wanted to talk about the American Rescue Plan, uh, which was approved earlier this month and provides direct federal fundings to cities like Bellevue, which is great news because the previous funding did not apply to cities of our size. So under this legislation, Bellevue is actually going to see, receive $2.7 million with half of the funding available as early as May of this year, and then the other half uh, available in May of next year. And this funding creates an opportunity for the city to provide additional aid to individuals, families, and businesses who continue to suffer from the impacts of the pandemic. And in addition to that, our state legislature recently passed House Bill 1368, which disperses $2.1 billion in assistance from a federal package and staff is working with the State Department of Commerce to determine eligibility to receive these funds. So staff will be providing briefings to council to discuss recommendations, options, and deadlines to expend these funds. I really wanna thank our federal delegation for its tireless work on behalf of our residents and for the direct funding our city needs to meet the emerging demands due to COVID. Our state senators, Senator Patty Murray, Senator Maria Cantwell, and our congressional leaders, Congressman Adam Smith and Congresswoman Susan Del Bene have worked tirelessly on our behalf to deliver this cr critical funding for our community. And lastly, I wanna thank our fellow council members for their work advocating for Bellevue and our region at the state and federal level. So this is really good news. And with that, I would like to, uh, let's do roll call. Clerk? Mayor Robinson? Here. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse? Here. Councilmember Barksdale? Here. Councilmember Lee? Here. Councilmember Robertson? Good evening, I'm here. Hello. Councilmember Stokes? Here. And Councilmember Zahn? Here. Thank you. So we have our third grade students from St. Louis leading our flag salute today. Can we get that going, please? Allegiance to the flag. Terrific, thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, uh, clerk, do we have any communications today? Oral communications? Yes, thank you, Mayor. There are four individuals signed up for oral communications this evening. And with that, I'll call the first speaker. And that is Lei Wu. Ms. Wu, can you hear me? Ms. Wu, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Thank you. Your time begins now. Thank you. Dear Mayor Robinson and council members, thank you again for approving a budget amendment of uh, 200,000 for the next phase of the proposed cross culture center in Bellevue. We uh, acknowledge council member Lee's uh, leadership and we are very appreciative of uh, staff's diligence in moving this project along. Many in the community are very excited about this project and are, are eager for opportunities to give input into this project. Based on our common passion for a future Bellevue Cross-Culture Center, a group of community leaders and organizations have come together as Friends of Bellevue Cross-Culture Center, FBCC, to begin building community support for the center. In a written testimony, 
to you earlier, I have provided you with the statement of our purpose. We wish to request your recognition of us as a community group that can function as a partner with the city, keeping stakeholders aware of and supportive of the center from the ground up. The feasibility study of the proposed center calls for a community champion, a group that includes representatives from the city, community stakeholders, and the corporate sector. Our group of cross-sector stakeholders is growing and we've started conversations with the city staff. We would like to continue in this role as a community champion partnering with the city, such as BDN and the new communities of color coordinating team. Our efforts are consistent with the welcoming city's collaborative and effort to support and equip East King County cities in furthering their diversity, inclusion and anti-racism work. We believe that diverse voices should be heard continuously throughout the design stage and all further development stage of the center. We're ready to provide our support based on our roles in the community and the relationship we have uh, with various uh, stakeholders. This oral testimony is given on behalf of uh, Friends of Bellevue Cross Culture Center, which includes community leaders and individuals associated with the following organizations, Ethnic Heritage Council, American Romanian Cultural Society, International Montessori Academy, Ethnic Chamber of Commerce Coalition, Chong and Co LLC, Seattle, Indonesia Sister City Association, Microsoft, Honorary Council of Ukraine, Chinese Information and Services Center, Black Heritage Society of Washington State, Irish Heritage Club, Turkish American Cultural Association of Washington State, Washington State Jewish Historic Society, East Side for All, Seattle Chinese Cultural Theater for Tomorrow, Biz Diversity LLC, Foundation for International Understanding through Students at the UW, Indian Association of Western Washington, CSL Consulting, Greeks in Washington, Bridal Trails Community Club. Uh, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Wu. The next speaker on the list is Lauren Reif. And Ms. Reif, I do not see your name on the list, but if you are one of the listeners connected with the phone, can you use star nine to raise your hand? Again, Lauren Reif, if that is you, can you use star nine? Okay, I will go on to the next speaker who is Barbara Chevalier. Ms. Chevalier, if you are one of the members connected with a phone, can you please, thank you. Uh, nope, actually, I see that's a different speaker. Um, Ms. Chevalier, can you use star nine if you're connected with a phone? Okay, and our final speaker on the pre-registration list is Dennis Glynn. Mr. Glynn, if you are connected with a phone, can you please use stars nine to raise your hand? Okay, I do not see any of those three speakers. However, I do see Don Marsh, your hand raised. Would you like to provide oral communication? Mr. Marsh, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, do you intend to make oral communication tonight? Yes, um, so I would actually like to speak for Barbara Chevalier who wasn't feeling well tonight. I can provide her comment. Great, thank you. Your time begins now. Okay, good evening council members. I am Barbara Chevalier, a co-founder of 300 Trees, an all volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and expanding Bellevue's urban tree canopy and I wanted to present an update of our recent and upcoming activities. Our spring tree giveaway on March 5th was a great success. We distributed over 270 free trees to pre-registered Bellevue residents in a COVID safe event held in the parking lot of the East Shore Unitarian Church. We were happy to welcome the deputy mayor and council members Lee and Zahn to the event. And we were fortunate to have dry weather and a small army of passionate volunteers to efficiently load eight kinds of native trees into waiting vehicles. We are confident that we could comfortably distribute twice as many trees at a single time, and we hope to do so in the fall as we continue to expand our giveaway capabilities. Our next event 
is a small 50 tree giveaway reserved for Bellevue College students, faculty, and staff in honor of Earth Day and will be completed on campus in April. We are also working with the college to secure nursery space so we can grow our own seedlings and reduce the cost of our trees, stretching every donated dollar further. Over the summer, we plan to begin our outreach directly to residents, supporting the expansion of existing green spaces and enriching neighborhood blocks with donated trees and technical advice. In the fall, we are especially excited about a large collaborative project planting 300 trees on the Sammamish High School campus. We are partnering, partnering with the Sammamish Student Environmental Club, ENACT, the Bellevue School District, the YMCA Earth Service Corps, and Propagation Nation, an, organiz an organization that donated 1,000 sequoia seedlings to Bellevue a few years ago. Funding will come in part from a grant distributed by the Washington Department of Natural Resources and the US Forest Service. These plans put us on track to plant 1,000 trees on both public and private land throughout Bellevue during our first full year. If any of the council would like more information, or if you have an idea for an event that is well suited to the passion and capabilities of our volunteers, we would be glad to meet with you. Our mission is to bring the benefits of abundant trees to every resident of Bellevue, beautifying our community, helping to stabilize our climate and bringing hope to future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marsh, for speaking for Ms. Chevalier. At this point, that is the end of our pre-registered list of speakers. If there's anyone connected to this meeting via phone or computer that would like to provide oral communication, please use the raise hand function or star nine if you're connected with the phones. Mayor, I do not see any additional hands raised. That closes oral communications. Okay, thank you. Next, we have a report from our city manager where we'll hear um, a status report on the neighborhood area planning program. Mr. Miyake. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I have one item under the manager's report. As you mentioned, it is a status report on the neighborhood planning program. And just by way of background, the community development department is leading an effort um, in the community to develop new neighborhood plans for two neighborhoods, Northwest Bellevue and Northeast Bellevue. Uh, this evening, staff will provide a status report again on the community engagement to date, vision development, and upcoming steps in the process. Um, this topic was last in front of council back on October 12th in 2020, where we gave a status report then. Tonight's um, uh, presentation is informational. No direction or questions are being asked of council this evening. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to Emil King, assistant director, as well as Elizabeth Debrett, uh, senior planner, but both from community development. Emil. Thank you, city manager Miyaki. Uh, good evening, mayor, deputy mayor, and members of council. Uh, last spring, the city relaunched neighborhood area planning in Northwest Bellevue and Northeast Bellevue, two of Bellevue's wonderful neighborhoods. This work seeks to engage community members on forming the vision and associated goals and policies to guide their neighborhoods looking forward. It's been really great to see residents learn more about the planning process and for staff to learn about what community members view as key issues. We're continuing to strive to reach new residents and, and try new forms of outreach in an effort to have our engagement reflect the makeup of the community. Tonight, staff are here to provide a progress update and outline next steps in this important planning process. So I'd like to now hand it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Emil. Good, good evening, Mayor Robinson and members of council. I'm gonna pull up the uh, presentation here. So as city manager Miyaki uh, mentioned, this is really just an, an update for your information today. Um, and we will be going through the process so far that, that we've gone through for Northeast Bellevue and Northwest Bellevue is kind of an initial two neighborhoods for this process that we hope to continue in the future. And, you know, we're gonna start with showing you just a timeline here. Uh, we were last before council in October and that was really kind of fairly early on in the process. We'd, we'd really been building relationships with the community and had shared with you some of the ways in which we 
have been facing um, community outreach during the coronavirus pandemic. And so now we are much further along in the process and can share with you some of the events we've had and some of the things we've heard from the community, and then also what next steps there will be. And just as a reminder, the neighborhood area planning process is part of the larger comprehensive planning amendment process. So we will be coming back to council in the fall as part of that annual CPA process. And uh, between now and then we will be engaging with the planning commission on this. So we're gonna walk through some of what we've done so far. I'm not gonna uh, touch on every single event, but a lot of them are listed here um, and are kind of outlined in the memo as well. But to start off, we wanna talk a little bit about how we've been engaging with the community and that this has really been led by the community as, as a goal of this project um, so that we, we really address um, issues that are brought up by the community and really make these be a collaboration with residents. And so there are a lot of different ways we, we've done that, but we wanted to start with kind of the, the big picture. So on this side are some of the, the overarching ways that, that we've worked with the community and, and some early meetings we did. And then on the next slide, I'll go into some of the more recent activity. Um, you know, there've been a lot of challenges to reach out to the community and really work with them throughout this process due to the you know, nature of being remote. A lot of our, our outreach efforts that are kind of a typical methods are not available to us. And so staff have really worked hard to find unique ways to reach out to, to the community and still get a diverse sampling and still hear from lots of different individuals within both of these communities. And so I'm gonna walk through some of the ways that we've done that as well. Um, we've been really using our engagingbellevue.com platform. This is our online system where residents can uh, engage and kind of learn about the, the actual project. And so you'll see there's, there, there's different levels here on the right about how people have engaged. Being aware just means that they've, they've gone on there and kind of been aware that, that this is happening, maybe clicked, clicked around once or twice. Informed means that they, they've really kind of clicked around and, and seen multiple parts of the project. And engaged means that they've actually written a comment or kind of participated in, in the you know, survey or, or other physical way of actually giving us feedback as well. And so throughout this process, we've really been using Engaging Bellevue to talk with the community. We've also found a lot of ways to reach out to more diverse parts of the community. And so whether um, this is for cultural outreach assistance, which is a program that we've, we've initiated through this project where we've hired four part-time staff members to engage with the Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and South Asian communities. And so we've, we've done several events that, that, that are really focused with these communities. Um, we've had breakout rooms at our larger meetings that, that have been held in, in other languages and really just kind of reached out to these communities um, in a more kind of holistic way and, and really using the networks that, that already exist. And so that's, that's one example of, of a new way that, that we've been trying to adjust and really get diverse feedback. Um, we've also had a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Our cultural outreach assistants have had 34 one-on-one -on -one meetings with, with individuals or groups as well. Um, we've had meetings with PTSAs, with neighborhood associations, all sorts of groups, uh, faith groups as well. So a lot of outreach happened early on in the project to really form that base. And then we, we really launched into a series of meetings throughout this process that, that we've been holding over Zoom. And a lot of those meetings have been associated with um, things posted on Engaging Bellevue that residents are able to respond to on their own time as well. So that there, there's really multiple ways for, for individuals to get involved. So we, we, we started off with a lot of kind of visioning work and, and values conversations to really identify where these communities want to be in the future and really set a baseline and really a North Star for, for these plans. Then as we moved into the fall, we've worked through some, some data sets um, about these communities to identify what's unique about them from you know, a demographic standpoint, from all sorts of different data, um, looking at you know, everything from mobility to demographics to sustainability, all sorts of things. Um, and then we've, we've really started turning the conversation into ways for the community to 
explain what challenges and opportunities they're seeing that their communities are facing and brainstorm solutions. So rather than just identifying issues, having the community come up with ideas. And so we've, we've just finished up, you'll see uh, March 17th and 18th was the last one of these kind of brainstorming sessions um, that, that were topic specific. We brought in people from a number of different departments to help um, have these conversations as well, but really just hearing from the community on some of these issues. You'll see what, what the uh, four topics that have really come up in both Northeast and Northwest Bellevue neighborhoods are affordability, mobility and access, trees and open space, and community connections. And these conversations have been pretty different between Northeast and Northwest. Um, we've always made sure that these two communities are separated into different breakout rooms if we have combined meetings. And um, we also have, have many meetings that are focused on individual neighborhoods, but you'll see these numbers here are kind of combining both neighborhoods together. And then you'll see that on the top here, there's just a couple examples from some of our, our online engagement. I'm sure, we're, we're all kind of sick of these Zoom faces, but it's been a great way to really hear from the community. And we've been using this annotation tool where all these words and kind of hearts up there on the left are, are ideas from the community. And that's been a great way to, to have immediate feedback as well as our kind of on your own time going engaging value and you know su submit a comment ways of, of engaging. And so next steps here is really to dive into the actual policies and, and, and more specific kind of detailed elements of these plans. And so we've really identified um, what challenges are facing these communities and some ideas from residents on, on how to address those. And staff are currently crafting policies that we're gonna bring back to the community throughout April and really get feedback from them on some of these specific policies and, and issues that, that they've brought up. We also wanted to highlight some of the demographics of the outreach we've done. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we really wanted to be aware of, of who we were talking to throughout this, um, especially since you know we can't table at a grocery store and, and get get you know just the word out there to a wide variety of people. And so we wanted to make sure that we're still reaching a diverse segment of both of these neighborhoods. So we've listed some of that data on this slide here. Uh, again, this is combining Northeast and Northwest data, um, but you'll see that on the left, there are averages for the events. And this is kind of an average across all events. And on the right is, you know, we, we had a big survey that was answered by several hundred residents. And so looking at their demographic information as well for that online engagement. And, you know, high level, um, looking at sort of the race and ethnicity question, uh, the numbers for the online surveys are fairly in line with the numbers for these two communities, which is great to see. Uh, the gender, you can assume, you know, really should be more of a 50-50 perhaps. And so we're getting a little bit more kind of females than males engaging with us in both platforms. Um, as far as kind of the ages of attendees, um, both of these neighborhoods actually have a higher level of, of seniors than most of Bellevue. And so we have seen that reflected in these, in this engagement as well, but we've also had quite a bit of engagement with youth. We actually have um, a volunteer intern with us um, that has been working with us from the local high school. And so it's been great to see her youth engagement and really hearing younger voices as part of this uh, communication and engagement. And then also looking at home ownership, um, you can see 78% and 82%. And in these communities, uh, they are about 65% and 79% for these two communities. So we are relatively close to that demographic data as well. So I'm just gonna wrap it up by reminding you of the, of the time frame and that we will be back before council as part of the annual CPA process in the fall. And I wanna thank you for your time, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Miyake, do you have any other comments? Not, not at this time, Mayor. Okay, so I'll encourage council to comment or question offline, uh, but feel free to follow up. Uh, next is our uh, consent calendar. Do I have a motion to pass the consent calendar? I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, we have three study session items. Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce them? Yeah, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, 
uh, the, we, the first uh, topic on your study session agenda is the Human Services Commission recommendation on the 2021 Community Development Block Grant funding as it relates to the coronavirus. <clears throat> and just by way of background, um, this is the second allocation of CDBG funding in response to coronavirus. The first um, allocation uh, was taken up by the council last year in May of 1990. Tonight, um, we are seeking direction on a, in the form of a resolution approving the funding recommendations for the 2021 Community Development Grant Funds. Um, joining us this evening is Michael Shiyasaki, uh, Director, as well as Didi Panolano, Grants Coordinator, both from the Parks and Community Development, I'm sorry, Parks and Community Services Department, as well as the Human Services Commission Chair, Michelle Klein. With that, I'll turn over to Michael Shiyasaki to begin the presentation. Michael? Thank you, City Manager Miyake. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Neuenhaus, and City Council members. I'm Michael Shiyasaki, and I'm here tonight with Grant Coordinator Didi Conolano and Human Services Commission Chair Michelle Klein to present the Commission's funding recommendations for the Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG CV3 funding. Other staff who are present are Assistant Director Tony Esparza and Human Services Manager Alex O'Reilly. Uh, um, and other members of the commission are watching virtually in support of their recommendations. Next slide, please. This evening, we're seeking council approval of the commission's recommendations for CBG CV3 funding. If approved, we would plan to bring back the recommendations on the consent calendar at your April 5th council meeting. Next slide. So here's a, a brief history of the CV funding authorized under the Federal CARES Act. In all, $5 billion in funding in three allotments and a shout out and thank you to our federal delegation who have brought about this funding. Next slide, please. As you may recall, the city council allocated the CV1 funds to homeless shelter services in May of last year. At that time, the council also allocated just over $500,000 of unspent prior, CDB, prior year CDBG funds for projects that responded to the coronavirus in the areas of emergency financial assistance, child care, and legal assistance. The CDBG CV2 funds have not yet been allocated and the Human Services Commission will be identifying the priorities for the CV2 spending at their April 6th meeting. Now, Didi Catalano will review the eligibility criteria and funding process for the CV3 funds. Didi? Thank you. As is the case with regular CDBG funds, CDBG CV projects must be an eligible activity that meets a national objective, and applicants must have the capacity to comply with the complex regulations required by this funding source. CV projects must also specifically prevent, prepare for, or respond to the coronavirus. CV funds must avoid duplication of benefits, which occurs when a project receives funding from multiple sources, including CDBG CV and the total funds received is more than the, than the total need for assistance. If that occurs, the excess CDBG CV funding must be returned to HUD. The commission selected three priority needs as the focus for the CDBG CV3 funding. These priority needs are based on data provided by human services staff, probation staff, the city's wraparound coordinators, and a presentation by the city's prosecuting attorney and defense attorney who both sit on the probation advisory board. Rental assistance is in great demand to avoid what is being called a coming tsunami of evictions. Although the governor just extended the state eviction moratorium to June 30th, back rent will still be owed when the moratorium expires. The Washington Department of Commerce estimates that tenants in the state have accrued $100 million a month in owed rent since the moratorium was implemented in March, 2020. Rental assistance will help pay that back rent and avoid evictions when the moratorium is lifted. The Northwest Justice Project estimates that 60 to 140,000 people are in danger of eviction or mortgage default. 
In an average year, there are 17,000 evictions filed in the state of Washington. Food insecurity has increased tremendously during the pandemic. According to the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, there was a 27.6% increase in applications for food assistance between March and December 2020, compared to the same period in 2019. According to King County's COVID-19 data dashboard, 11.7% of Bellevue households in zip code 98007 received supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits in January 2021, a 19.2% increase from January 2019, and a 2.1% increase since December of 2020. And behavioral health needs have grown as well. According to the February 15th COVID-19 Behavioral Health Impact Situation Report, just over 2 million adults in the state reported frequent symptoms of anxiety on all or most days of the previous week. Those in households earning between 25 and 35,000 per year report the highest rates of anxiety at 55%. And the younger the person is, the greater the frequency of reporting anxiety and depression. The National Alliance of Mental Illness, or NAMI, reports that national data estimates indicate that 40% of the community is experiencing adverse mental health conditions. That calculates to 57,700 Bellevue residents. NAMI also reports a huge need for culturally competent mental health services. A request for proposals was focused, excuse me, a request for proposals focusing on these three areas was issued on January 11th to a wide list of agencies, including those that have not been funded by the city before. 15 applications were received, totaling almost $2.2 million in requests. That is 1.29 million more in requests than funds available. The Human Services Commission reviewed and discussed the applications at their February 17th meeting and held a public hearing on their preliminary funding recommendations on March 2nd. I'd now like to introduce Michelle Klein, Human Services Commission Chair, who will present the Commission's funding recommendations to you. Thanks, Dee Dee. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to present, to present the Human Services Commission CDBG CV3 funding recommendations to you tonight. We began the allocation process by determining the most urgent needs based on data presented by staff. Ms. Catalano noted in her remarks, the commission selected rental assistance, food assistance, and behavioral health as the focus areas for the request for proposals. The commission reviewed 15 applications that were received for funding. In addition to reviewing the specifics of each proposal, commissioners evaluated how each applicant complied with three criteria that were outlined in the RFP. The first criteria was if the program served a significant number of people disproportionately affected by the pandemic, including the BIPOC community and people with behavioral health or other disabilities. Commissioners reviewed the demographics that were submitted by each applicant and gave weight to those programs that served a high percentage of these populations. Of the eight applications recommended for funding, five serve a large percentage of BIPOC residents. Because there's not enough money available to fund all of the qualified applicants, commissioners favored these programs that reach these underserved populations and other populations that we uh, deemed were appropriate to focus on. The second criteria was the applicant's experience administering, administering CDBG or other federal funds. HUD suggests that this be one of the criteria used to evaluate agencies for funding. These funds have more complex administrative requirements than the city's general fund grants and a, and a demonstrated capacity to successfully administer federal funds is an important part of the commission's risk assessment when deciding whether to recommend funding a project. It's particularly important that agencies have procedures currently in place to verify and document the income eligibility of their clients. If low or moderate income status is not documented properly, the activity could be determined ineligible for CDBG funding by HUD. The commission does not want to put the city in danger of having to reimburse HUD with general fund dollars if an ineligible activity occurs. The third criteria used to evaluate the applicant applications 
was whether the agency could spend the funds in a timely manner. Programs that were up and running and ready to comply with all CDBG regulations were given priority over those who would have to implement new procedures. The commission felt it was important that these services start as soon as possible to meet the urgent needs in the community. The commission's funding recommendations and rationale are included in your attachment B in your packet. As you can see on this slide, we are recommending that the majority of the CDBG CV funds be allocated to rental assistance to address the enormous backlog of unpaid rent in the community. Our recommendations for food assistance will help congregations for the homeless fill the gap created by no longer being able to accept food don donations due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the YMCA's food box delivery program will help families experiencing food insecurity who live in, in King County Housing Authority properties in Bellevue. And finally, our recommendations for behavioral health will provide badly needed services to populations that have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. On behalf of the entire Human Services Commission, I'd like to thank the City Council for this opportunity to present these recommendations to you and for your support in ensuring that all of Bellevue's residents can thrive and reach their full potential. That concludes our presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair Klein, for being here tonight. And thank you, staff, for that presentation. Um, I'm going to call, uh, starting with Deputy Mayor Newhouse as the liaison to our Human Services Commission, and then Council Member Stokes, Lee Barksdale, Robertson, Zahn, and myself. Deputy Mayor, would you start us off, please? Uh, certainly, and thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you uh, to the Human Services Commission staff on the on the great report and just to the great uh, work um, as we waded into the CDBG funds and the best approach to allocate these funds. I thought the commission just did an incredible job in terms of being very thoughtful, uh, intentional, and very inquisitive too. Uh, in terms of how we were going to uh, disperse these funds. As was previously mentioned, uh, these are complex grants. Um, I wish they were not so complex so that we could actually increase the pool of agencies that could work within our community and, and disperse these funds, um, but um, it is what it is. So um, uh, because of that, um, we had to be very selective in terms of what agencies were set up um, uh, that could handle the uh, complexity of these grants and then also get, the, get, get these funds out as quickly as possible. Um, and I think rightly so, um, very much focused on and, and leverage that information that we know uh, previously um, uh, from, from the work during, during this pandemic about the re rental assistance, food assistance, and then the behavioral health, health being so uh, paramount right now in terms of uh, helping those, those three areas uh, for residents in, in, our, in our community. Um, and then certainly, I think the approach in terms of understanding who the underserved populations or uh, communities are within the city of Bellevue, um, again, that demonstrated capacity to disperse those funds uh, and then disperse them quickly, uh, what, what was paramount. And I can, you can see from the uh, organizations that were selected and the money given uh, uh, to those organizations, you know, I certainly have a very um, uh, high level of confidence that all of them are going to be able to do exactly um, uh, what they said they were going to do. And um, I, I think these funds are definitely going to save lives. I think they are going to um, prevent uh, people from going homeless, going cold, going hungry, um, or getting the mental health um, services that they may need during this very difficult time during this pandemic. So um, just, again, incredibly proud of the work that the commission has done and uh, uh, Chair Klein here being with us as, as, uh, as well as uh, the rest of the commission um, watching from, from home right now. But I'm just going to quickly call them out because I think they've all done such a great job. So they're watching Ben, Samara, Tim, Ted, Sherry, Judith. Thank you so much for your work. Really appreciate it and great job. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, end my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Stokes. Yeah, this is very, uh, very exciting and uh, a great presentation and a very thoughtful um, review by the planning, I mean, by the, the Human Services Commission. Um, I appreciate the Deputy Mayor's uh, 
thorough review of this. It's nice to hear the process as well as the, as the results. And it sounds like a really good result this time. Um, and, and Michelle, you did a very good job of uh, both putting together the presentation, but guiding uh, the group through. And I know how difficult it is on these things. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good package. Uh, it's a good balance. I like the support of the BIPOC community and the mental health um, support uh, specifically. There, all the others are, all of them are very, very, uh, uh, you know, needy and and uh, very appropriate. Um, and I think that um, you know the uh, uh, the way that the staff and uh, the uh, commission have worked together has been very positive as well. And staff did a good job in the presentation. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're ready to go. And it's just, uh, we're very fortunate to have this funding and um, it's not enough, but it sure helps a lot. And I think we're doing it and spending it and working with people in a very positive way and we'll have good results. So uh, to everybody who's uh, been involved in it and uh, helped make this happen, uh, congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I always have the highest admiration for Human Services Commission for doing such a tough job, you know, to try to figure out, you know, where you can actually help with some money. Because as you as always, you just described, the need is, you know, twice as much, more than that, then it's needed. And the people who are applying it, it's also just a portion of people, you know, who really need it. So the needs is five seeds, what we can do. So it's a great, great, I mean, it's a big challenge, great challenge to figure out who actually you can fund, who can help. It's a, it's a very, very tough job. I always kind of joke, you know, uh, the reason that, you know, the council can't handle this, we don't want to tackle this. So we give to a bunch of volunteers <laughs> to, do the, to do the tough work for us. So I really appreciate you know, what Human Service Commission is. And thank you for Chair Klein, you know, to leading this effort. And obviously staff it has a tough work to get to the point, you know, uh, that the, the applicants to the point that you have a chance to, you know, to help the council to make those decisions. So thank you. Uh, you know, my council always been, you know, we have a lot of constraints when you do a CDBG fund. You know, they have requirements, are you capable, your, uh, your filing uh, ability, your history, you know, so it has certain constraints, which we have to live with, obviously. So I understand that. So that's my only comment. That's why I'm really glad in the early part of this year, last year, this year, but, you know, in our budget council, or even before that, you know, we were able to use some of the city funding, you know, which doesn't have all those constraints to be able to establish, you know, uh, build capacity with organizations that are new. So most of the people who get you know award are, are, are social are agencies that have already proven they've done it a lot a lot. So but they're newer coming up because there's a new community, newer capacity. So I think the city has done a great job recognizing it and working on that. So I want to compliment the city also recognizing that and make an effort. So so I just say that you know hopefully. Uh, you know, that, this reflected on the applicants, like, you know, for tomorrow, like uh, Salvation Army, you know, some of these new uh, entities, and they, I think they do good, great work, they do good work, and they actually can fill a needs, but, you know, they don't meet the criteria, so uh, I, I, I feel sorry for them, I have sympathy, and I think that Human Service Commissioners, you feel probably the same way. So, with what we have to work with, uh, I want to thank you. And you do a great job. And all these people, uh, and your people are definitely in need. They need to be helped. And all these organizations, they do great work and they are feeling the needs and we appreciate what they are doing, what they help us to serve our community. So absolutely, I, I agree, I support uh, what you are doing. I, I wish we could do more, you know, so thank you. And that's, really as much as I can say. So thank you and thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lee. Uh, Council Member Brexdale. Hey, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I just wanna thank the commission for the thoughtful recommendations, staff for their support. I, uh, 
uh, serve as a council liaison to the probation advisory board and we often talk about the need um, in that space. And also uh, wanna thank the federal delegation and um, I'm glad to see uh, that we've included a new trusted partner who serves our BIPOC community, uh, Central Culture of Mexicana. Um, and I think that will also help us uh, further improve our reach to communities who are disproportionately impacted by, uh, by COVID. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Council Member Robertson. Thank you. I support the recommendation um, for all the reasons that have already been said. It meets a lot of the goals um, that we've set at helping the people most profoundly impacted by the COVID um, impacts. So, um, and I would just thank the Human Services Commission. Great, thank you. Council Member Zahn. Yes, thank you. I echo all the comments that have been previously made. It is such a tough job to look at all of the need in the community, right? over $2.2 million worth of ask, and we were, were only able to provide $900,000, right? So it's, it's a tough uh, decision to make about who is actually gonna get the funding. So I just really appreciate the work. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, one is when we think about um, the state percentages of renters that are in need, the 14%, do we have a sense for what percentage would look like in Bellevue in terms of the renters that are um, in that cusp of uh, eviction if they don't get support? Uh, Council Member Zahn, this is Didi. I looked for specific statistics about Bellevue and was not able to find something that was drilled down quite that far. Um, okay. I was I, just I, curious. I know it's, it's a tough thing to try to get a handle on, but it, it helps us to get a better understanding of that. Thank you. Um, and then, then the other one I have is um, on the solid ground where you talk about the 90,000 of unspent, does that mean that that money will not be able to be used? Because it, it can't be uh, forward, it, it can't be used for 2021? Um, last year, Solid Ground contacted me around the fall and said because of various reasons, some staff turnover they had and other um, extenuating circumstances, they didn't think they could spend the full amount. So being given that warning, I was able to reallocate or the city was able to reallocate the money to LifeWire's housing stability program. Uh, so, and they were able to spend that balance of 35000 completely down last year. So there was no money left on the table. And I appreciated solid ground coming forward and, and letting us know what was happening so that money could be put to good use. And thank you. I'm not surprised at all that um, you guys are amazing, right? That we are literally taking every dollar and supporting our community and LifeWire does amazing work um, for the community as well. And then I would say lastly, um, I understand about the reason why Hero House didn't look like we were able to provide the funding. I do think that hopefully in this next um, tranche of funds that will come from the, the federal relief that we can um, support Hero House because some of the work that they do serving our community with mental illness is, is just so critical. And although I can understand why, you know, their needs of transportation and outreach may not fit the criteria of the CBDG. So, all in all, I'm just really appreciative of, of both the commission's work as well as staff to help our community. Um, thank you for answering my questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I just wanna thank Chair Klein and the Human Service Commission. It is a tough job and they do very good work. Um, and it's a, it's a rapid response to an everlasting need that we have in our community. And so I appreciate the opportunity to uh, support this allocation of funding. I think council member might have asked this question, Zahn may have asked this question already, but I was thinking about something council member Barksdale said, I think I missed the answer because um, he was talking about um, the juvenile justice program. But um, is it possible to find out how many residents in Bellevue are going to be at risk, have their housing at risk once the eviction moratorium ends? I, I will certainly do my best to, to get that data. I'm sure there's a way we can find it. Okay, terrific. All right, thank you very much. So um, our next 
study session item is our environmental stewardship initiative quarterly update. Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce that? Um, can you, Mayor, um, I guess I'm- Oh, no, I'm sorry. Do you want to have a motion? This evening? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I totally blew that. I knew there was something. <laughs> sorry about that. Is there a motion uh, to approve this recommendation for funding? I move to direct staff to prepare legislation approving the funding plan for 2021 CDBG CV3 funds in amount of $897,287 for adoption at a future meeting on consent. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay, thank you. So next up is our ESI quarterly update, Mr. Miyake. Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, this is the first uh, quarterly update to Council um, since uh, you adopted uh, the updated Environment or Stewardship Plan. Um, at that time, the Council direction to staff was to bring back these quarterly updates. Um, the intent of tonight's session is to provide an overview of the 2021 ESI uh, annual work plan, including an outline of the ESI implementation enhanced engagement approach, as well as some highlights of some several early wins that um, have happened. Um, this topic was last before the council on December 14th of 2020, when in fact you adopted the, the environmental stewardship plan update. Um, this presentation this uh, evening is informational, no formal direction is being asked by the council this evening. Uh, obviously uh, questions are welcome as well as feedback. So um, joining us this evening is Matt Cummins, our director, as well as Amy King, assistant director, and Jennifer Ewing, environment stewardship program manager, all of the community development department. And with that, I'm not sure if I'm handing this over to Matt or to Emil, but I'll let them decide. Uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Miyake. Uh, on behalf of the Community Development Department, I wanted to give a few opening remarks. Um, and good evening, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of Council. Uh, tonight, Jennifer Ewing, our ESI Program Manager, will provide an overview of what to expect in 2021 regarding the ESI actions. Um, it's important for Council to remember this is a strategic five-year plan that will be rolled out based on available resources and will gain momentum over time. The really exciting parts of the enhanced engagement framework to be highlighted tonight are the ability to engage a broader set of interested residents and members of the business community and how this engagement will assist in accomplishing 2021 actions. We really appreciate council's strong support for environmental stewardship, both in municipal operations and community-wide efforts. We're very excited to get started with implementing these actions. In future quarterly updates, you'll be able to track our ongoing work that will cul culminate with an annual ESI progress report. So with that, I'd like to now um, turn things over to Jennifer Ewing. Go ahead and unmute Jennifer. Sorry about that, my computer is moving a bit slowly here. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, sorry. Can, can you see the presentation right now? You're still um, in your screen. Okay. All right, hold on one second. My computer is slowing down here. Jennifer, this is Charmaine. I can take over if you would like. Okay, um, is that working? That works. Okay, great. Sorry about that. My computer was moving slowly. All right. Um, well, good evening, Mayor uh, Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and members of the council. I am um, excited to be here tonight for the first uh, quarterly update of the Environmental Stewardship Initiative. Um, as was mentioned, tonight is for information only. Uh, I'll give an overview of our work plan for the year, talk about our enhanced engagement approach, and then highlight some uh, early wins. Okay, so 
as you remember, this was last before council on December 14th um, last year as part of the uh, adoption, review and adoption of the environmental stewardship plan, we heard a desire from council for quarterly updates. Um, there was some additional funding included in the budget for both enhanced engagement and also for some quick win projects. And then we also heard a, a desire from council for to you know aim to seek partnerships to support the implementation of the plan and to also lead by example through um, sustainability efforts in our municipal operations. So to kind of give a high level overview of our work plan for the year, uh, I've, I'm including some of the bigger efforts we have underway or will, will be getting underway this year. Um, the icons there represent the different focus areas in the plan. Um, we have some of these kind of phased throughout the year in terms of when they're starting. Um, but to, to kind of give you an overview of the list, the climate vulnerability assessment is something we're looking to do as part of the pre-work for our comprehensive plan update. That'll actually start a bit later in the year, but wanted to include that. Um, part of some of the early win funding that you provided are gonna support the, the two bullets here under energy, the Clean Buildings Act, Clean Buildings Act support and home energy retrofit program. Uh, those are gonna be two new programs that I'm excited about. The Clean Buildings Act is a, a statewide legislation requiring uh, buildings over 50,000 square feet to meet certain energy efficiency targets. Um, so the, the state's gonna have some technical support, but we're really gonna kind of go a step beyond that for the, the buildings in Bellevue to help them comply. And then there's also some early adopter funding that we want um, to help buildings in Bellevue take advantage of. And then we're also looking at um, developing a, a new home energy retrofit program. Um, this could, you know, we're really in the very early stages of this, but the intent is really to kind of supplement and build on um, PSEs, energy efficiency programs, our um, community development uh, block grant weatherization programs and that sort of thing. So looking to kind of fill any holes that might exist. Um, moving on under the municipal operations, the kind of two bigger items there are developing a green fleet strategy and then also working on some bigger energy efficiency projects um, in our city facilities. We also applied for a Department of Commerce grant that we should hear about, I think at the end of April. So we're um, hoping we'll be successful on that one. I think we have a pretty competitive grant application. Um, so hopefully more, more news on that next time we come back. Um, under the mobility and land use, um, We'll be working on, you know, incorporating sustainability into, you know, a number of the kind of bigger land use projects going on this year. Under waste, um, you know, the utilities department is really looking at building on some of their work to date to really kind of focus on um, improving uh, multifamily recycling rates. And then under trees and natural systems. Um, kind of two big things we're working on developing our own tree giveaway program and we've also been working with 300 trees and and supporting some of their efforts and looking at also how they can support us for our tree giveaway this fall so we're really excited about that also really um, looking to use an equity lens in how we develop that program to um, dedicate you know, a good portion of the trees to the neighborhoods in Bellevue that have lower tree canopy and also setting aside some trees for residents, lower income residents and you know, some of our target demographics. Also working on um, doing some analysis and soliciting ideas for tree planting locations. So what you see here, this is you know, more the work plan for the environmental stewardship program and our resource conservation manager program. There's also, as you remember, a number of actions in the environmental stewardship plan, such as the mobility implementation plan and the watershed management plan, for example, 
that are being led by transportation and utilities. So I haven't included all the things on the work plan just because there's you know quite a few other things that will be coming to council. Um, kind of led by other departments. So I'm just, you know, highlighting some of the, the key things here. Okay, so the other big thing on the work plan for this year that really kind of underpins all the um, actions uh, listed on the previous slide is um, the enhanced engagement approach. So as the plan was being adopted at the end of last year, we heard a desire for us to continue to engage with the community, both some of our, our stakeholder groups and also our residents um, to support the implementation of the plan. So, you know, we heard a desire to leverage uh, the subject matter expertise of residents and stakeholders, um, build partnerships, leverage some of the best practices in the community, um, and really, you know, continue to collaborate with stakeholders to implement the plan. So we thought a bit about the, the best way to approach this um, and how to kind of formulate or organize our outreach. Um, as part of the plan update, we formed a sustainability leaders group um, comprised of you know, some of the larger employers in Bellevue, some of the, our, our business groups here, uh, the school district, Bellevue College, you know, a number of kind of major stakeholders here. Um, which was great to you know start to for one just build some of those relationships around sustainability, learn more about what others are doing. But they also you know provided some great insights into our plan. So our approach for enhanced engagement is really to kind of continue some of that work and build on it. Uh, we use the Eastside Pathways Collective Impact Model as a, a bit of kind of an inspiration. We're not you know, completely following that approach, but um, definitely looked at, at that as an idea. And then, you know, again, really focusing on implementation and how can we work together and find um, areas of common interest to, to support the implementation of the plan. And then um, also continuing our engagement with, with residents and resident groups. So really um, for the enhanced engagement, what we're calling it is the Sustainable Bellevue Partnership. And there will really be sort of two prongs to that, you know, the stakeholder group engagement and then the, the resident engagement. For the stakeholder groups, you know, we, we had a list of groups we worked with as part of the plan update we're kind of starting to revisit that list. We also want to include um, you know, some of our local environmental groups like the, the People for Climate Action folks and 300 Trees as part of that group. Um, so kind of, we, we have a list from who all we worked with, but you know, already starting to hear some ideas of other groups we may wanna to add to that. Um, and then kind of, we'll have this sort of umbrella of the Sustainable Bellevue Partnership, and then we'll have some, committees, which is where, you know, a lot of the work is actually going to happen. So as we look to build out um, some of our commercial energy efficiency programs, for example, we'll really want to bring in the subject matter experts on that, such as property managers, building owners, um, those kind of people. So the ad hoc committees will be a bit flexible from year to year, kind of depending on what we're working on. So we're excited about this approach as a way to, you know, for one, help us really advance our work um, and our work plan, but also to really help catalyze partnerships, you know, between the city and other partners, but also, you know, we'd really like to see some partnerships amongst the partner, uh, the different organizations as well. So um, just kind of a quick overview of some early wins. Um, you know, a number of these things are, are projects that were in the works um, kind of, from last year, so not necessarily using the, the quick win funding that we received, but you know some nice um, project successes that I just wanted to highlight. So recently, PSE, you know, kind of did the official um, turn on, if you will, or flip the switch for their um, Skookumchuk wind farm and the Lund Hill solar farm, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, those will provide uh, renewable energy for about 70% of our city operations. And um, because of the fact the, the wind farm, um, that project was actually quite delayed due to the complexity of the project. 
that's um, helped to reduce the rates in some of the, the damages PSC was able to collect in terms of um, the project being you know, pretty significantly delayed. So we were already you know, poised to save some money on our energy bills through this contract and, and the savings have actually increased, which is exciting. Um, as Don Marsh um, mentioned, we'll be working on um, our own tree giveaway project, um, which we're, we're excited about. And then also excited to have some of our, our partners, both 300 Trees and the school district, um, they received a grant from uh, the Department of Natural Resources. So exactly the kind of partnership we're you know, really excited to see happening to do a, a wetland restoration and tree planting at Sammamish. Um, we are, we went through an application process to get some electric vehicle charging stations at the Bellevue Service Center uh, from PSE through one of their pilot programs. So excited to be able to um, provide that for, for our staff and for our fleet. And then finally, the, the city was awarded an ICMA um, Certificate of Distinction perform for Performance Management, which was for the entire city, but our environmental stewardship uh, performance dashboard, you know, was really featured in our application for that. So um, I'm proud to have contributed to that um, award and acknowledgement. So in terms of what's next, um, like, like we said, we will be coming back for quarterly updates. Um, the next update is going to focus more on, on our performance. So um, what are, you know, what are the outcomes from last year in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, that sort of thing. I think it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what the, what the data looks like since last year was such an anomaly in many ways. Um, and then after that, we'll, you know, really try to provide more kind of updates on different focus areas so we can spend a little more time, for instance, talking about work we're doing for our city operations or for trees and natural systems, et cetera, and then always kind of providing some project successes. And then other next steps are officially launching the Sustainable Bellevue Partnership and then you know, really getting moving and pushing up our sleeves on a lot of these projects and programs uh, we wanna get underway this year. Um, so for that, uh, that pretty much wraps up the presentation. Again, this was for information only and yeah, thank you very much. All right, thank you. That's a great presentation. Um, I'm gonna call council members in this order, council member Barksdale followed by Robertson, Stokes, Lees on Deputy Mayor Newenhouse and myself. So council member Barksdale, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And thanks, Jennifer, for the, the great report. It's good to see that we're partnering and um, with the organizations in our community who are passionate about environments, environmental sustainability. I just wanted to um, add, I know you had mentioned elsewhere, but just sort of iterate the importance of working with the youth organizations. I know you had mentioned in, a, in our previous conversation, Youth Link, so, um, and then, uh, on the watershed management plan stakeholders, I noticed that that didn't have stakeholders listed yet, but I just wanted to suggest um, maybe the flood control district, um, our Native American tribes and Trout Unlimited as maybe a few for starters. Um, and then the last thing that I would just recommend is uh, looking at ways we can continue to, in, in partnership with the organizations, um, figure out what data they need in order to take on some of the creative actions um, um, in the community. So just one example, we had talked with some youth of, over a year ago, I think it, were, it was, and they had ideas about creating an app, right? Um, around to, to encourage people to um, engage in more sustainable behavior on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think just having that conversation to figure out what data would be helpful for businesses and, and individuals in the community to take action would be useful. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barksdale. Uh, Council Member Robertson. Thanks. I appreciate the update. I'm glad that we're doing these quarterly now so that we can keep our fingers on the pulse of what's happening with our environmental stewardship initiative. No, I think this looks good. I, I really am pleased with the, in particular, with the outreach that we're doing, trying to make sure that we get people hear from them and and hear from them and let them get engaged with us. I think that's very supportive. So thanks for the presentation. 
Thank you. Council Member Stokes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for the presentation and uh, really giving us some pretty good detail of what's going on. I assume that uh, I'd like to sometime, <laughs> we don't have anything else to do, so really go through the detailed package and see that because it's really exciting to, to see what we're doing and understand it and tie it into other work. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the trees, which um, I think is a very, very important thing. Um, and I, I'm really glad to see uh, the 300 trees and, and uh, community coming together in, in, a, in a very positive way to help with uh, focusing on our canopy and, and those things and uh, the work that you're doing on that as well. Um, and um, one of the things that I have a little concern about, um, we've gotten some emails recently from some people who've had some very, I think thoughtful, probably missing some information and all, but I'm assuming you'll, uh, you know, some staff will respond to them, but very concerned about uh, what they view as a significant number of trees being cut down for development. And that, that is gonna be a big issue, I think, in, in ongoing years. We, um, you know, we want to get to our goal, but uh, it's hard to uh, sometimes plant as many trees <laughs> as, as are taken out. So I think that's a big challenge. And I do think that's something uh, you can help us look at uh, overall in, in our, uh, as we grow in the Wilburton area, particularly and others. Um, and some of the developments that we've, we've been talking about recently um, will end up with uh, a lot of trees gone. So it, it's that that's always a battle, but I think you're uh, going in the right direction of really addressing that and very positively and uh, look forward to, uh, you know, your success in that. Um, the, uh, let's see, I had one other thing. Um, I think the, um, the other group you didn't mention, but I think we can, and I can certainly help that is uh, with the Rye 8 Salmon Recovery Council working more with the city, with, particularly uh, with the Kokanee, um, a work on uh, Lake Sammamish, but you know the whole thing on the, uh, saving the uh, the salmon and the sound is all uh, important for all of us. It's all tied together, so we can do some more work there. And the last thing I want to mention is um, I uh, wholly re uh, completely recommend and think that uh, really getting into and finding out how it really works, a collective impact model to do certain things is is just um, it's just outstanding. So I'm glad you're looking at that and. Again, if I can be helpful on that, um, let me know. Because that's what we've been doing in the East Side Pathways for some time. And um, it's good for all, to, all of us to connect and learn from each other on these things. So that's good too, but great work and really um, pleased again, as others have said, to have the uh, quarterly reports. I know it's a lot of work, but I think it all keeps us all really focused on the conversation and um, uh, you know, knowing more about it means that we can support it more. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Council Member Lee. Thank you. Uh, some of us uh, went to the 300 trees giveaway and uh, I didn't get one because I didn't pre-register. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I live in Somerset. Somerset trees is always a controversial topic. Uh, you know, so I have a question on that. Uh, I think, you know, Mr. Stoke mentioned that there's a lot of trees that's been cleared for certain development. You know, I think that's where the, the attention need to be paid is when you have a development, we have a lot more development coming up. So you have trees, trees just go. When they, you know, uh, are taken away, they're taken away big quantities. When you put them out, you put them out, you win at the time. So you know, I think there needs to be some, some attention, some way to look into how to develop and not to lose <laughs> that many trees, right? And so I, I don't know, maybe there's something, you know, uh, Jennifer can uh, think about it and you know, address it a little bit. Um, my second question is, it's a, uh, it's a compliment. You talk about emphasizing on partnership. I think that's good. I think the, the, the city, you know, as far as I heard, even tonight's discussion, I think that's really a, a great way to go. When we do a lot more stuff, we need to, you know, leverage and use partnership. You mentioned the East Side Pathway as a collective impact model. Maybe you can explain a little bit what you mean by that. And if you can do it now, I'd be happy to uh, learn from you a little bit later, you know. And so it's up to you. Give us a quick, you know, 30 seconds or we can talk about later. 
Sure, I can I can give sort of the the quick answer, and then yeah, I bet some of the other council members. It sounds like um, Council Member Stokes is also pretty familiar with it. But I think the main idea is to bring together a bunch of organizations that have similar goals and missions, and then you develop a, a sort of shared set of goals and a shared agenda, which in um, you know, for Eastside Pathways, the goals are really around um, educational attainment. Um, and, and actually, they may have some other goals too, but I, I think education is the main focus. It, you know, for the case of the Sustainable Bellevue Partnership, the goals would really be the, the goals that we've outlined for the city in the Environmental Stewardship Plan. That's a good, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I just thought about this friends of uh, uh, cross culture center, you know, that's uh, organizations, individuals, they all working together, they all brought mm -hmm. together. So that is really like what you're talking about. It's, uh, you know, uh, collective impact uh, partnership. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Council Member Zahn. Um, yes, well, thank you, Emil and Jennifer. I love this, right? Thank you so much for the quarterly updates and the quick wins. And also the name, right, to brand it Sustainable Bellevue Partnership, where we are about how do we have quick wins? How do we have the long game, too, about implementation towards our goals? How do we be that convener of all of these different, hopefully, partners that are going to continue to grow? So I really like that. And I think the key is that, you know, as we reopen, this is the moment to really reimagine as we look at the, the newer normal, what pieces we want to put in place so that we can really strengthen this effort. So I like the fact that we've got right trees and electrification and clean energy and, and home energy retrofit. I, I love that. Um, and then the data with the, the dashboards. Um, I do want to make sure as we look at the retrofit program that from an equity lens, you know, um, if people are expected to do the retrofit before they get reimbursed, that may create a barrier from an equity standpoint for those that may not be able to pay ahead of time to get reimbursed. So I think we just wanna be cognizant of that. And then um, connecting with Youth Link Board and Bellevue School District, because I think they have sustainability ambassadors and, and you know our youth are just amazing. They have so many ideas, they're so creative. So really uh, leveraging that. And then um, I hope that as we engage with the community, we're also thinking about how to make it fun. I mean, I don't know, maybe this sustainability Bellevue partnership can have a mascot, right? Just like I remember growing up, Smokey the Bear was all about protecting, right, the forests. So is there some, some fun element to this that we can interject as we are planting trees, right? I remember um, the mayor and uh, council member Lee and I planting sequoia trees at, cross, at um, Wilberton Park and then being with the 300 trees and just seeing the excitement of people picking up their tree, knowing that they're going to plant it and do good in our, in our communities. And so I'm just super excited about where we're going and the fact that, you know, this is about us being a convener model with kind of like Eastside Pathways and how we through the engagement with the community are gonna to move towards the kind of goals that we have and moving with urgency, which is what we talked about, right? So um, anyway, just excited to get going and hopefully we can get back to a place where we can go out and plant trees together. Cause I think we really are thirsting for that connection. And um, the ESP is I think the place where we're gonna see that kind of connection with our very community. So thank you so much. Thanks. Deputy Mayor Noonhouse. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, yeah, great comments uh, so far. I think we're all equally uh, very excited about this. And uh, Jennifer, Emil, thanks for, thanks for the update and congratulations on the award. Uh, and speaking of that dashboard, uh, Jennifer, are we gonna see that updated next quarter or two quarters from now? When do you think you're gonna come back to us with that? Next quarter. 
Next quarter, fantastic. Yep. That's great. And I just, it's just, it's just so great to hear about all these partnerships, all this, all this outreach with, I just love the fact that we're just leveraging all these uh, fantastic, um, uh, you know, subject matter experts and these, and these groups and individuals that all want to be part of this solution. So just very excited about where this, where this is headed. Um, quick question for you. We did have a, uh, an email into the council today about construction site recycling. Um, I have to admit, I didn't know this you know was it was a possibility or was limited in terms of recycling but i was wondering is that does that fall under the clean buildings act or is there a place within the esi right now that that would fall under and if it's not should we look at incorporating that into the actual plan yeah um I, I saw that email as well. I haven't had a chance to kind of fully look into that issue, but um, so King County does have a construction and demolition waste ordinance that mm -hmm. applies to the whole county, not just the unincorporated areas. And then that lists out specific materials that um, construction and demolition materials that do need to be recycled. Um, so, so that does exist. Um, now, I think, are there potentially some areas where it's a little difficult to enforce? I think, you know, that is probably the case. I'm not sure how some of the counties work around enforcing that has been impacted um, due to, you know, COVID related budget cuts. Sure. They did have some construction and demolition waste um, enforcement um, officers uh, previously, but I, think I maybe heard they may not anymore. I'm not sure. Mm. So yes, the, the, you know, there might be some, <laughs> there might be some um, additional things we as a city can do to help kind of just further promote the county ordinance and provide some more um, education around that, okay. um, you know, for projects in Bellevue, and then also understand, you know, is there anything else we could do? But um, you know, we, we do have that that ordinance that projects here are um, required to comply with. Okay, great. And is that for residential as well as commercial? I don't remember exactly if it's for all construction types or only projects of a certain size. Okay, sorry. Well, if you could follow up with me, that'd yeah. be great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, just going off of that, I think the, the goal was to reclaim some of the old growth wood that our older homes are made of when they are demolished which would be great. So I'd be interested in learning more about that also. Um, so I'm, I have th three questions. I'm wondering how we partner with PSC to get more uh, EV charge stations in Bellevue. Yeah, so that's um, definitely something we've been working with them on about how we might be able to get some more stations at City Hall, also at um, the Bellevue Service Center and then you know, through the utilities and um, transportation commission, they do have um, the ability, they, they're kind of running a few different pilot programs right now to um, put more charging stations in their entire service territory. So that is something we've been working with them on. Yeah, I think some of the existing multifamily developments probably could use that, but I know there's certain conditions that have to be there in order for them to put them in. So. Uh, I hope that that's possible. Um, Ms. Uh, Council Member Stokes talked about this. Um, you know, one of the things that I get the most input from uh, our residents is wanting to change the, the codes about how many trees you can cut down when you build a new home or uh, any kind of development. So I wonder, you know, can we re-examine those codes at some point? Do we have it, that on our schedule to do? Yeah, that is included in the plan um, to review the um, tree codes. I think as, you know, community development and development services are, are working on our work plans for the next couple of years, trying to, you know, figure out when to incorporate that, but that is definitely, you know, something that's included in the plan. Okay. And on the radar. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, going off of what council member Barksdale said, I know that Bellevue High School has an environmental group and I'm sure every high school does. So make sure that we include those students in as well. That'd be great. Okay. Yep. Thank you for that presentation. 
Now, the last thing on our list is regional issues, and we have a lot of information in the packet. There is no presentation, but I did want to open this up for questions or comments. Um, uh, we have Joyce Nichols here with us tonight to answer any questions that you might have. So I can see everybody. If you raise your hand, I'll call on you. Not seeing any hands raised. Okay. I want to remind you that we do not have a meeting next Monday as it's a fifth Monday in the month. So it's a rare uh, Monday night off for us, but we will reconvene in two weeks. So with that, uh, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.